everybody. Today's service is starting in one minute. And today we're kicking off a new series titled The Lost Parables of Jesus with today's sermon titled A Lamb. So let's find our seats, turn our phones on silent, and let's get ready to worship our Lord. and welcome to this morning's worship experience. My name's Alyssa and I'm so excited to welcome you today. Thanks for joining us and spending some of your day with us today. If you're joining us online, please comment and let us know that you are here. And for all of you who might be joining us in person for the very first time, I encourage you to please fill out one of those connect cards, which is in the seat pocket in front of you. Just a reminder for tithes and offerings, you can send an e-transfer to vpcctreasurer at outlook.com or you can place your tithes and offerings in the boxes here in the sanctuary. Just a couple of announcements for you. First of all, I want to let you guys know about our annual ladies tea that's coming up in about a month here. On Saturday, May 13th, us ladies are going to be gathering together for a ladies' tea. This is for all ages, whether you are a kid or an adult. We want you here and we welcome you. Please feel free to invite your daughters, your mothers, your friends, your grandmothers. It's open to everyone. Tickets go on sale today. They're $5 each and you can come and see me for tickets. But you don't want to miss this event. It's a wonderful time of fellowship spent together celebrating women. So please come on out on Saturday, May 13th at 10 a.m. here at the church. And again, tickets go on sale today. Also, I just want to remind you about Party at the Point, which is going to be happening on Sunday, August 13th. We're excited. This is our community event. We cannot wait for this event to happen. And we cannot do it without you. First of all, I just want to ask for volunteers. We need lots of volunteers, so please consider volunteering. Starting in May, there will be a volunteer sheet up out in the front foyer, but right now all I want you to do is pray about it and think about volunteering because we need lots of volunteers for this event. Secondly, if you also want to help us out financially, you can. A couple of ways you can do that is donate your bottles. If you would like me to come pick them up or you can bring them to the church, Donate your bottles and all of that will go towards Party at the Point. The second thing is those quarters for kids. We handed out tubes about a month ago and you can fill up those tubes and bring them back. Once they are filled up, bring them back to me and again, all that money will go towards Party at the Point. But those are a couple of ways that you can help us out. Pray for this event, pray for the volunteers. Thank you so much for all of your support. And again, it's gonna be happening on Sunday, August 13th. To know more about us, or about our events, or even about our small groups, please be checking our Facebook page, as well as check out our website, which is vantagepointcc.org. And for all of you joining us in person, get yourself a bulletin. Now, let's get this service started. Good morning. Thank you for joining us in person and online. Let's begin to worship this morning.
we are starting a new series calling the lost parables of Jesus. And no, these aren't parables that, you know, were found in some cave somewhere, um, brand new to us. They are simply what Jesus tells us in Luke 15 about lost. So this morning, I want to start off with a modern day parable. And the modern day parable talks about a rocky coastline where ships often find themselves in trouble. And, during, and in this rocky coastline, there is a small group of volunteers who have built a, what really amounts to a hut. And they man this life-saving station so they can go out and rescue those who are in trouble. And so they come day and night to man the station. They go out in the boats. They pick up people out of the water and take them back to safety. One day, some of the people who have been rescued decided that, you know, this little hut wasn't really good enough for what they were doing. They wanted to build something bigger and, and nicer. And so they donated some money and they brought in some, some workers and they kind of updated the hut. They made it nicer. They, they, they replaced the old stools with some comfortable seating. They made a, a new, you know, coffee center where people could get a cappuccino when they came in from being rescued. Um, they, they built some showers into the back, just made it much nicer station. Of course, the membership of this life-saving station continued to grow. It had become kind of a social hub for the town. And so more and more people started to come to the life-saving station. In the, in the room where they held the initiation, they had a, a life-saving boat. But less and less people really wanted to go out on the water to save people, so they hired staff that would do that, that would go out and help save people. One night, a fairly large ship found itself in trouble on the rocks. And the life-saving saving personnel got into their newer boats and went out and started to pull people out of the water and bring them to the life-saving station. Of course, the people that were being brought out of the water were dirty, wet. Some of them were foreigners. And it caused a crisis inside the life-saving station. They quickly hired somebody to hook up an outdoor shower so that people that were being brought in from the water could be showered off outside before they were brought into the station. But when the crisis was over, they held a meeting. And at the meeting, they discussed whether or not they wanted to continue their life-saving activities. The vote was split. There was a large number of people who simply wanted to quit doing life-saving things. Of course, there was a small group of people that said, you know what? This is who we are. This is why we exist. We can't stop our life-saving activities. The bigger group won the vote and basically said to the smaller group, if you want to go and save lives, go and do so somewhere else. They did. They went and built a small life-saving station just down the coast, and volunteers once more went out onto the water to help people that were lost and in trouble. But history repeated itself, and history repeated itself, and history repeated itself. And today, if you go to this coastline, you will see a number of private clubs built on the cliffs of the coastline. It is a place where ships often get into trouble and flounder. Many people drown.
probably can catch the imagery and the intention of the parable. We are the life-saving station. We are here for a, a purpose. And often, it is a purpose that we don't live up to, talking about the church as a whole. The next three weeks, we're going to look at the parables of, of Luke 15, starting with a, a lamb today. Next week will be a coin and finishing up with a son. But really, the, in, the intent of each one of the parables is the same. And it's not an easy one for us to get our, our head around. Here it is. The Christian church at its most basic level, is an organization that exists for people who will never attend the church. We are here for people who will never come inside this building. Many won't. We will entice them. But this place is foreign. And yet we are here to serve them, not us. And that begins a huge discussion. Because now we have got to decide what is it that we can do so that we can be the life-saving station God intended us to be. And at the same time, how do we make those who are here and volunteering happy. And that's not always an easy, an easy thing to do. I was at a meeting this week and I was talking with an old saint of the church. And as we talked, one thing that came out was, well, you know, these are the things that make me comfortable as an old saint of the church. And I'm sure that they are what will make people who are lost or people who, are, who don't know Jesus Christ comfortable. And I, I think I just smiled, but in, inside of me I'm going, probably not. There are probably some things that you find very comfortable that they find very off-putting. How, how do we address that? How do we be the life saving station that we were always intended to be. So, we are going to look at the first parable. I'm just going to read it for you. It's the parable of the lost lamb. Now, tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in open, in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. It's a hard teaching. That first blank, if you're trying to keep notes, is there but by the grace of God. You've probably said that. I know I have. Can't tell you the situation, but I, I know I've used that phrase. And it is probably a phrase that we need to lose because it's not really true. Last week, we, I talked about the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee comes in and he says, you know what, Lord, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. 
It's just another way of saying, there but by the grace of God go I. God, I'm glad that you made me who I am and not a tax collector or not a robber. I'm glad that I understand you. There but by the grace of God go I. A few dec- couple decades ago, yeah, let's, let's just leave it at that. I was in a church, it wasn't this one, and we were pioneering the event that would become our party at the point. And I can remember what we did. I was in a meeting. I was a young pastor who didn't know anything and you know, was stupid enough to be able to come up with stupid ideas. And this meeting, I was about to come up with one of the stupidest ideas anybody has ever heard. Every year, this church did a Sunday school picnic. We rented a place, usually in Sherwood Park. And we would go there on a Saturday, and we would pack up and get a whole bunch of food, and we would take the church out to this park, and we would play games and share food and have fellowship. And we, this meeting was to plan this year's Sunday school picnic. Now, like I said, I was young and stupid. And so as we're starting to plan the Sunday school picnic, I came up with this idea. What if we didn't? And everybody was shocked. They just kind of looked at me like, we always do this. So what if we didn't? What if we took the money that we would normally spend on going to Sherwood Park and renting a place and you know, doing all those sort of things. What, what if we took that and moved it to our parking lot and threw a party for the neighborhood? What if we gave them free hot dogs, free pop? What if we had games for them to play? What if we just marketed it as, you know, we just wanted to say thanks to our neighborhood for allowing us to minister in their midst. What if we did that? And you can imagine the response this young pastor got. It wasn't all positive. <laughs> We've always done a Sunday school picnic. You can't do that. But there was a few, and most of them ha- actually happened to be some of the workers that thought, maybe there's some merit in this idea. And so we started to work towards our first, what we called it back then, was celebration of life. Um, we actually did it, I can really date it here. Um, this was like we we're going to be right around September 11th, like the first anniversary after. And we had a lot of Muslim people in our neighborhood, and as well as other ethni- and ethnicities. And we just wanted to pull all these people together and say, listen, we are, we are a neighborhood. Let's celebrate together. We even decided that we were going to move our church service from the sanctuary to the parking lot on that day. And I can remember the week before this grand event was supposed to happen. And I sat down after the morning service in the back of the sanctuary with an old saint of the church and he was concerned. He said, Gary, why are you doing this? Church isn't outside. It's inside. These are things, we, um, church is about, is about us. It's not about the neighborhood. And as I'm sitting there talking with him, trying to assure him that, you know, yes, this was a strange idea. It was an experiment. We'll see what happens. I thought of this parable of Jesus. And so I started to tell him the parable of how Jesus talked about that one lamb that wandered off. And the shepherd was to leave the 99 and go and chase after the one. 
And this saint of the church is sitting in front of me and shaking his head. And he says, I don't get that parable either. Aren't the 99 worth more than the one? Aren't the people that attend here worth more than the neighborhood? Why do we have to do this? I don't even think that saint is alive anymore, but I don't want to, I don't want to insult him, but that was exactly what the Pharisees would have said. Jesus, why are you chasing after tax collectors? Sinners, which were pretty safe just putting prostitutes in there. Why are you chasing after them when you could be eating with us? You don't want to hear this, but whenever the Bible talks about Pharisees, the Pharisees were the religious people of the day. He's really talking about us. Because there's always the tendency that when we see Jesus moving among the lost, we will be jealous and say, why aren't you doing that with us? Why aren't you ministering to us? I could almost hear this guy that I was talking to saying this of me, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. But we're a life-saving station. That's what we are supposed to do. I just want to talk about the three events that we just came through. And I'm, I'm, I'm bad sometimes for not making sure that we are grounded in what we understand about the Lent Easter season. Lent starts off with this idea of Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday, we come. We recognize our mortality, that one day we will die. Everybody does. The, the, the group that are still alive when Jesus comes back won't, but that's a, a single generation. All the rest of us will die. So Ash Wednesday, we gather together and we recognize our, our mortality. We, we have communion. We receive, if we want, you don't have to, we receive the mark of the cross in ashes on our forehead or on our hand if we're more comfortable there. And we have a time of introspection, confession before God. And then we move into Lent, and Lent is a time of sacrifice. You, know, you give up chocolate or something like that. And you go for 40 days without doing whatever that is. Or, and I like this idea actually, adding something to what you do. So I know people who have read through the New Testament in the 40 days of Lent. They added a practice of, of going in and, and reading significant chunks of the Bible for 40 days. But there's some sort of sacrifice that happens through Lent. And we come to Monday, Thursday, the Thursday before Good Friday, which is actually the end of Lent. That's the last day of Lent. And we, and we come to the end of Lent and we realize that essentially we're the same people that we started out to be. Nothing's significant changed. Maybe we lost a couple pounds if we gave up chocolate for 40 days. Maybe our, our blood pressure is a little bit better if we gave up salty foods. But nothing significantly has changed because we know that our sacrifice can't make us better. And so after 40 days of Lent, we, we, we come to this conclusion that not only are we mortal, but that anything that we do can't get us where we want to go. And then we come face to face with Good Friday. And if you've heard me talk, Good Friday is the high holy day of Christianity. Not Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday is great. But the high holy day is Good Friday. Why? Put it this way. 
if it wasn't for Good Friday, we could celebrate that Jesus defeats death on Easter Sunday. But we have no way of being included in that promise. Christ hasn't died for our sins, which is what we needed. The only way that the promise of life can be meant for us is if Jesus dies on the cross on Good Friday. And he extends his blood to cover my sins. And then, because his blood covers my sins, I get to come to Easter Sunday and celebrate that Jesus has defeated death. Because I know that I'm covered. I know that the work that needed to be done inside of me has been done. But something I can't do alone. What we learn throughout this whole process is that we need to come to God as the tax collector did. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's who I am. God, without your mercy, without the death of Jesus on the cross, I am nothing. And I am destined for not a great ending. Have mercy on me, a sinner. What the Pharisees missed was that as the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to Jesus saying, have mercy on me, that was precisely what they needed to do. But they had been fooled by the idea that they thought that their sacrifice and their good living was going to get them where they wanted to go. And it wasn't. So our, our cry is not there, but by the grace of God go I. It is, Lord, have mercy on me. That next blank is an obvious answer. Here's where we part a little bit with the story. For us, it's not obvious. When Jesus says, you know, suppose a shepherd lost a sheep and he left and he had 99 that were together, what would the shepherd do? Did did you hear what Jesus said? He said, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And the implication is, is that this is an obvious answer. Of course he does. Of course he runs out after the one. He wouldn't be a good shepherd if he didn't. The 99 are okay. They're, in, they're, they're together. They're, they're, they're in a pasture. They'll be fine, but I've got to find the one because the one is in danger. And so it was an obvious answer. Of course you're going to chase after the one. What would you do if there was a fire this morning? You've probably seen signs like this. We've got no stairs. You don't have to worry about it. Actually, we do right here and there. So if I can't use... Oh, no, I'm okay. I can can use the stairs. Um, It's obvious. You You find your loved ones and you get out of the building, right? That's the obvious thing that you do. And we're pretty good at doing obvious things. I love this one, actually. I think this is the one we should post. In case of fire, leave the building before posting it on social media. Uh, You know, it's probably more of our, you know, we're sitting here as the building's on fire, making sure that Facebook knows. We're good at doing the obvious, right? Well, maybe not so much. Um, A number of years ago, Neld and I were on vacation, and we were in a BC town, BC resort town. We had a a room in a hotel, and we had just spent the day at the beach. So we came back, and we were going to go out for supper. We'd already picked the the restaurant that we wanted to go to. And so um, I told Nelda, just let me, you know, grab a shower, and then we'll go for, we'll, we'll go for supper. So I I grab the shower, and I get out of the shower, and Nelda starts knocking on the door and telling me, 
the fire alarm is going off. So I did what any man would do. I got dressed. I got dried off. I opened the door slowly to see what was happening in the hallway, where I saw a bunch of other men that were standing around trying to figure out what was going on. But the fire alarm was continuing to ring. And so, because we're men, we decide that it's time to get our families out of the building. Now, if you're in a hotel room, you'll see a little map that says, you know, in case of fire, this is the way that you go. It's the shortest way out. Don't take the elevator. You've got to take the stairs. And, and so you go to this stairwell and you go out of the, out of the hotel, right? So Nell and I are, are coming out of our room. Fire alarm's still going off, but there's no smoke. I did the, you know, the smell. There's no, there's no smoke. And the problem was that, that the stairway that was going to be the safest route out of the hotel brought me out on the wrong side of the, of the hotel from where my car was. And we needed to get the car so that we could go to supper. So I did what any man would do. Um, we, did, we took the long way. We went to probably the stairwell that was farthest from the safe way out because it was the one that was closest to our car and we left the building. We found out later that the, you know, the fire was in the kitchen, so, um, which, which was kind of the opposite direction anyways. So it all worked out for us. We didn't die in the fire. But sometimes things aren't that obvious. Sometimes we're, we're not good at understanding what is supposed to be obvious. Jesus' whole message here is that it is the obvious thing to do. If a shepherd loses a sheep, you go find that sheep. It is valuable. In my illustration, getting to the door closest to my car is the most valuable thing which probably means I need a little bit of an adjustment. But the obvious answer to the problem was to go after the sheep. So why didn't the Pharisees see that was exactly what Jesus was doing? And it's sometimes because we miss the obvious. That last blank is the completeness of, of heaven. Language in the Bible is sometimes hard because English language wasn't designed to give us some of the concepts that the Hebrew or Greek does very effortlessly. For instance, consider this verse. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. We understand that, but that word for life... That's not psyche, that's suhe. Say that with me. Suhe. Suhe. Suhe, it means life. But it means temporary life. Life that you can't grasp onto. Life that you can lay down. Consider this Verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The life in this verse is not suhe. It's zoe. Zoe is complete. It is permanent. You can't lay it down. It is part of you. God did not die on a cross to give us abundant suhe. He died on a cross to give us abundant zoe, life that is permanent and can't be laid down. In the same way, Jewish thought was that this world, this earth, is temporary. It is filled with sue. It will be laid down at some point. But heaven is complete. It is filled with zoe. It is a place where there is permanence, 
where God is. And so when he says that all of heaven rejoices over the return of the Lamb, he's talking about this place of permanence that rejoices over the fact that one lost lamb has been returned to the fold. Or one lost person has been found and returned to the fold. For some reason, and I don't know what it is, but it seems like my Facebook friends like to, sell, like to send me videos of Alistair Begg giving the same sermon illustration every time. I mean, I'm sure he's preached a lot of sermons. But the only ones I get for on, on social media are always the same one. And I got it again this week from a friend. So I thought, okay, if you want to keep on sending it to me, I'll, I can tell the story again. Alistair talks about the thief on the cross who is giving up his sue. He will die. And life will no longer be with him. And he's talking about this, this thief on the cross and, and that moment when Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And he says, can you just imagine the shock on that angel's face that's manning the, dark, the, the gate of heaven when this thief comes and stands before him trying to get entrance into the into the into heaven, and he and he kind of looks at him and he goes, uh, "So, where was your church membership?" And the thief says, "I didn't have church membership. What Bible studies did you attend? I've never been to a Bible study." And the angel just kind of looks at him and goes, "Okay, well." Let's start from, you know, what is your understanding of justification by faith? And the thief goes, never heard of it. Okay, what is your understanding of the Holy Scripture? And the thief goes, well, I'm sure my mother read me some Bible stories when I was a kid, but I, I, I haven't had any contact with the Bible in my adult years. And this is flustering the angel. So, so he goes away and he finds a manager. And the manager comes. And they start talking with the manager. And, and the manager finally comes to this point. He says, what is the basis for you coming into heaven? And the thief responds, the man on the middle cross told me to come. I'm going to get people mad at me. Luckily, you're a small crowd this morning. I am convinced. People don't like my preaching, which is good. It keeps me humble. Um, Part of what they don't like is that I'm not very much of a hellfire and brimstone preacher. So if if you're one of those, here, here it comes. I'll give you a dose of it. If you are convinced that you're going to heaven because your theology is right, you're not going to make it. If you are convinced that you're going to heaven because you've got church membership and you've been a member of Baptist churches for the last, you know, 50, 60 years, you're not going to make it. The only way any of us will get into heaven is to understand that the man on the middle cross told us to come. That's it. There is nothing else. At some point in my life, and I can identify them, there were people who came and talked to me about the man on the middle cross. And they made me understand that his invitation was for me. And at the time, I didn't have 
any theological background or understanding. I didn't know about the various you know, theories of salvation and sanctification. I, all I knew was the man on the middle cross told me to come. And now, with increased knowledge, the only thing I know is that the man on the middle cross told me to come. If you're here this morning and you aren't sure of your salvation, I want to tell you. And it'll probably take a little bit more than just me telling you, but I want you to understand that the man on the middle of the cross has invited you to come. When you get to heaven, that is the response. Is that Jesus said he wanted you to be there. Through saints of the church, you have discovered this. When we go out and do things like party at the point, every person that we meet is somebody that Jesus wants to be there. The man on the middle of the cross has invited them to, but they don't know that they've been invited. Not invited to get their act together, but invited just as they are. Now, admittedly, If we enter into a loving relationship with Jesus, we want to do better than we have in the past. Every person I talk to has this idea that they want to do better. But your salvation does not depend on whether or not you do better. It depends on the fact that you understand that the man on the middle cross told you to be there. Nothing else matters. I was in a Bible study about 15 years ago. It was held in the basement of my house. And we had, I don't know, some nights probably 20, 25 people crowded into the basement of my house. And we'd play some guitar and we would talk about something. And I can remember after one of these meetings, uh, a, a gentleman came up to me and said, I think we need to split this group. And I'm saying, yeah, you're probably right with We probably do. And he said, because I don't want to be with these people who are young in the faith. I need more meat. And I'm going, you're probably right that we need to split, but that's precisely the wrong answer. you are having the incredible, incredible privilege of talking to people new in the faith and making sure that they understand that Jesus has invited them to come. And no matter how mature we think we are, that's all that matters. It's all that should matter. This isn't about getting our theology right. It's about understanding that Jesus wants us to be there. That here I am, have mercy on me, son of David, for I am a sinner. But I know that I am a sinner, that you have invited me to come to be with you. If you are trying to get your spiritual act together, good luck. But that doesn't stop the man on the middle cross telling you that you are with him. As you do it. And all of us here are trying to get our spiritual act together. None of us have arrived yet. We're all saying... Have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. But I'm a sinner that has been invited. I'm a sinner that the shepherd has come looking for and has found me and carried me back to the place where he needed me to be. Didn't do it by myself. God came after me. God sent 
his prophets in my life to speak to me. Until I understood that I am a sinner, but that he has invited me. At some point, what I think we forget is that we were all the lost lamb that wandered off. Every single one of us needed Jesus and somebody to come and get us and bring us back to the flock. And once we get back to the flock, we become the ones who find the lost lambs and bring them back to the flock. Because there are an awful lot of people out there that the man on the middle cross is still calling to come home. And if we love him, we'll accept the invitation and extend it to whoever we come in contact with. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the invitation that you extended to me. I thank you that it is not based on my theology that I get to go into heaven, but because you have invited me to be there. And God, lay on our hearts this week the people who are still away from you that you've been looking for. Help us to find ways to to love them. And maybe even to make them see that you are inviting them. That you love them. Just like you love us. God, don't... Don't allow us in our pride to believe that this is somehow about us. It is always about you. Lord, here we are. Sinners, speak to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with us? Of living color, 
flashes of lightning, rolls the thunder. Blessed and strength and strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Father, please, on bended knee, we beg you to come into our lives and just be the light in this world, this dark world that needs you. Please just work through us so your will may be done. Take these tithes and offerings that we offer you and use them for the betterment of your kingdom. Jesus' name, amen. If, if you're in person, you can drop off your tithing envelopes in the box in the front or at the back. And if you want to give through e-transfer, you can give at vpcctreasurer at outlook.com. i uh -huh.
May you trust in God's promises to his people. Peace, security, blessing, even when they are difficult to believe. May you know that God's news is good news, nourishing, true, even when people tell you it is not. And when you encounter doubt, may you strengthen your belief, guiding you in his perfect wisdom and counsel. Thank you for sharing part of your Sunday with us. We hope you'll come back again next week right here at Vantage Point, 11 o'clock, and on Facebook. Grace and peace. Have a phenomenal week.